but I intervened a fair bit as well. We'll go to uh, five minute rounds, uh, Mr. Cooper, and then Mr. Fraser, and then Mr. Cumming. Uh, Mr. Cooper, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to the witnesses. I'm going to direct my questions to Mr. Waterman. Uh, Mr. Waterman, uh, with respect to the uh, large employer loan uh, program, are there specific barriers to companies participating, such as the high cost of borrowing? Would you care to comment? Yes, I would. And to echo the witness, uh, Mr. Kiss's point, calling it predatory, posing as predatory lending or crafted by predatory lenders, it's certain that's certainly an accurate statement. Previously, I've described the program as a Faustian bargain masquerading as a payday loan with a smile. Um, the appointment of a board, board observer is a big red flag. Uh, when combined with the potential for the dilutive equity conversion, it could spell the company just signing over the entirety of the operations to, to the Canadian government. And I don't understand why they would ever want to be in that position, but evidently there's a, they've built the infrastructure and the deal in such a fashion. Um, for the net zero by 2050, there, the level of scrutiny and monitoring that's required to participate in the loan is something over and above what the highest rated ESG companies in Canada are already doing. Um, the administrative benefit, the administrative cost of it, we still haven't even been able to quantify it. Really, we, we are treating it as if we're not, not applicable for it. Um, the other large red flag in, is, in it is the 80-20 split between unsecured and secured. When you enter into a secured agreement, you allow everybody else in your secured lending syndicate to agree upon somebody else having a secured portion of it. So this opens it up, opens up our secured agreements at a time when oil volatility is at, at twice historical averages. So it's not really beneficial for anybody to enter into one of these agreements at the risk of having an additional three, 4% thrown on their, thrown on their senior lending. Um, and all of the senior lenders would have to agree unanimously to enter into this agreement this additional leaf agreement. And at a time, like I said, at a time when oil is trading at twice its normal volatility, it's just not realistic that we would enter into these programs. Well, thank you. And uh, just to clarify, Mr. Waterman, under the program, is it possible that the federal government could become the largest shareholder uh, in participating oil and gas companies under the program? Yes, under it depends on the evaluation on the equity side of the business, but in a number of in a number of evaluation methods, they could with the depressed equity prices of Canadian oil and gas producers, they could realistically become the largest shareholder in the company. And could you uh, elaborate on what you're hearing from member companies uh, that the cost of the federal program is too high? and uh, that stock options make this prohibitively expensive. Are you hearing any of those things from your members? I, I would defer to Mr. Tristan Goodman for that response. Okay, Mr. Goodman. Thank you very much. Uh, the answer is generally, uh, if you're referring to the LEAF program, the answer is yes. Um, it does appear that uh, access to the LEAF program at this point in time will be uh, cost prohibitive as well as uh, prohibitive on the uh, terms and conditions. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, now I'm going to turn to Mr. Uh, Egan. Uh, you spoke about uh, many shovel ready projects and uh, their importance as we look towards a post COVID uh, recovery. Uh, there are, can you speak uh, in that regard to the need to streamline the regulatory approval process? And also, I would note that there are some projects in the queue. Uh, that have been approved by the uh, Canada Energy Regulator, but are currently being held up by Cabinet. Could you speak to that as well? Uh, Mr. Egan. Yes, thank you for the question, Mr. Cooper. There, uh, in the submission I made, we listed a number of projects totaling in the order of $8 billion, which uh, we consider to be shovel-ready and which do not require uh, any federal assistance whatsoever. And the biggest challenge is on the regulatory side, uh, that challenge uh, is in some instances uh, sitting with cabinet. So for instance, uh, the NGTL uh, project, uh, the approval of which has been postponed for five months because of challenges uh, with the consultation process. That's the largest single one uh, we identified. 
Uh, those kinds of challenges exist with others uh, as well. There are a series of regulatory processes which, uh, particularly in the time of COVID, uh, need to be reviewed with an eye to putting projects in place sooner rather than later. Uh, the changes that are required uh, do not undermine uh, the fundamental environmental priorities uh, of the government uh, and would in fact move investment very quickly uh, to projects that provide both direct and indirect employment and more importantly continue to guarantee the availability of the affordable energy that's so important for so many other businesses that need to uh, restart post-COVID. And that's the point I just like to underline in respect to many of the previous questions and, and, and comments. The fundamental value proposition of the Canadian hydrocarbon sector is the affordable energy it's delivering to Canadians right across the country. And that energy, that affordable energy is essential to our long-term economic recovery. Okay, we will have to end that uh, round there. Sorry, uh, Mr. Cooper, uh, turning to uh, 